Hey everyone, welcome back to Policy Punchline. Here at the show, we interview scholars, policymakers, and journalists about some of the most interesting ideas and frontier issues in our world today. I'm Princeton senior Tiger Gao. Uh, my guest today is Matt Levine. He is a Bloomberg opinion columnist uh, covering finance. He writes the popular daily newsletter, Money Stuff, that has over 150,000 subscribers. He is widely regarded as one of the most iconic, witty, and sophisticated financial writers of our age. Uh, before Bloomberg, Matt was an editor of Deal Breaker, an investment banker at Goldman Sachs, a mergers and acquisition lawyer, a law clerk, and a high school Latin teacher. And he's someone I look up to a lot. And he inspired me to start writing my own newsletter on Substack and so on. So uh, I really want to say that this is a dream come true for me to, to meet one of my personal heroes. So oh, thank uh, you. Mr. Okay. Levine, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I, I feel an urge to call you Mr. Levine instead of Matt, partly you're, because you're the only one. <laughs> <laughs> partly, partly because I really admire uh, your, your writing, but also partly because I was trained in high school to refer to my high school teachers, you know, by Mister. That was kind of the habit. So, so maybe we should we should start from there because you are you taught Latin in high school. So, yeah, so how, that is probably <laughs> the last time that anyone like regularly referred to me as Mr. Levine right. was teaching high school Latin. <laughs> <laughs> which is very weird because I was like 22 at the time. Uh, I was right out of college and it felt, you know, I was like five years older than these kids and it felt very weird that they were calling me Mr. Levine. Yes. Yeah, so but it was, was good because otherwise they wouldn't have like respected me at all because, like, <laughs> you know, I was like, I was not cut out to, I don't know, I think it's very hard to be a 22 year old high school teacher. Um, certainly I was not good at it, but like, you know, like, the kids in the back of the class make jokes and you're like, ha ha, that's funny, right? Like it's, it's, uh, you're not, I didn't feel myself to be an authority figure. Um, and I was very bad at teaching high school Latin. Um, it was, it was fun and I liked my kids, but like, I just, I didn't have the, uh, skills to do it. Right. Like I knew some Latin and I liked my kids and I was like, how hard can this be? But like, you know, teaching is an actual skill set that is separate from content knowledge, and I just didn't have it. Um, and I had some good instincts, but a lot of bad instincts. Um, it's funny because it's like, it's very bad at that, and I did it for a year, and I went to law school as like all classicists do. But like, you know, part of what I do now is is like fairly didactic, and so like the um, uh, like I, I I feel like a certain teaching role, and I dream of one day being a, like a like a real classroom teacher again, and um, and then I remember that I was really bad. <laughs> so you never thought about doing research or, or taking on teaching in co college or so? Oh, so I definitely did. That's why I did it. That's why I, that's why I taught in high school to sort of see, which is not a good reason, right? Like, like you know, my, in my mind, you know, as a classics major in college, I thought about going to graduate school in classics. And um, I thought that I would teach Latin for a year to sort of try it out, which of course is not what being a college professor is, but like, you know, when you're young, you're like, oh, it's like a lot of teaching, right? Um, and so uh, then I, you know, independent of my being bad at teaching, I just sort of got cold feet about the idea of spending a decade in graduate school for no money. And I was like, well, law school is only three years. I'll do that instead, um, which uh, yeah. I found law a lot less interesting than classics, but it was definitely the right career decision for me. So. Uh, how was your experience at law school? Because after it was that, great. Did... It was really fun. Like it was, you know, like I did, like I did miss classics, and I did, in fact, apply to classics graduate school while I was in law school because, like, this is so dumb. This is law, um, but no, law school was great. It was really fun, um, and uh, I don't know. Like I feel, you know, I'm talking to like Princeton students, like <laughs> I hate the notion that law school like prepares you for anything because it yeah. doesn't. It closes a lot of doors. <laughs> it's extraordinarily expensive. It wastes three years of like your prime, like learning and, and, and working years. Um, like if you don't want to be a lawyer, I, I cannot recommend that you go to law school. At the same time, I didn't want to be a lawyer. I went to law school, it worked out fine for me. So I can't really, you know, I don't know. Uh, but but on the other hand, you were a classics major at Harvard. And even though you were top of your class and not a Victorian, you could say that that was an employable skill at all. <laughs> it was not an employable skill at all. I mean, did they prepare you? For I was anything? I was unemployable in a number of ways. Like I just didn't like understand work. You know, like I just like read Greek and Latin poetry. You know, and like at the end of it, I was like, oh, I need to get a job. 
and I didn't even like I didn't like know how to apply to like just like high school Latin teaching positions like a like a a professor in the department like knew a guy and was like hey you could probably get a high school Latin teaching job here and like got it for me you know like I didn't I didn't like I would not on my own have been able to get a high school Latin teaching job never mind a job at like Goldman Sachs like I I did in fact because McKinsey like uh like mail like you know yeah. recruits widely like I got yes. an offer to interview at McKinsey and I like went and did a McKinsey case interview and it was terrible and did not get called back or anything um but that was like the extent of my recruiting experience so I was not employable um despite having good grades and stuff uh and uh and and law school is obviously a great way to transition you know I went to law school and I um you know like my second year like you do like law firm recruiting and I remember thinking like, well, I'm not going to get a job. I'm unemployed. Like I have no skills. Like I'm good at school, but like who cares, right? And um, and I said this to like people who are like three hours who had done this process before. And they're like, you'll get a job at every law firm you apply to because you have good grades at, at Yale. And who cares? And I was like, but I don't know anything. I'm like not a good, you know, I'm not like fun in interviews. And then I got a job at like, every law firm I applied to because like, in fact, law firms just hire people with good grades at good law schools and don't care about like your um, skills at all. So it was it was an eye opening experience. I mean, it's hard to think about this. I mean, at, at those uh, you know, quote unquote, elite schools like Harvard or Princeton, you have all those uh, majors, liberal arts education, like classics or English majors. That that I mean, the, the most natural career path is either you go to grad school or you go to McKinsey or or, or Goldman to become a banker or a consultant, and they, they will train you. But so yeah i didn't way. know that in college um, which which was like which is like a blessing right it was really it was like it was a little stressful at the end but it was really nice to have like no thought about mckinsey for my entire four years of college um like no thought of goldman sachs uh uh but then so, you know so, I, ended up, I ended up at goldman right and like we, i did yeah. recruiting and like you know i'd like sit down and you know i'd go to harvard occasionally and i'd like sit down and there'd be like you know 10 kids with like applied math and economics to, you know double majors and I'd be like, ah, this again, right? Like, and I, all I wanted was to hire a classics major. Like, all anyone wants is to hire like an art history major. Like, it's Absolutely, it's like yeah. once you're once you're on the other side of the table, like you realize <laughs> yeah. how like incredibly appealing the like yeah. non finance majors are <laughs> at investment because like the investment like who cares? Like, 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 you, you learn the you learn the material in like three weeks yeah. over the summer. It doesn't matter at all, right? Like, what you want yeah. is like something interesting, and so. Uh, uh, during recruiting, I was like, please send us more liberal arts majors, but, you know. So, so in some sense, can't you say that your Harvard experience, your classics background, all that prepared you to be a better thinker, writer, and, and that is also fundamentally what you feel passionate about and what you do today. And, and the Goldman Sachs kind of employment ex experience with law school, that's just kind of adding some vocational flair to. Ooh, I wouldn't, I'm not sure about that. I mean, like, I do think that like, uh, like, you know, it's funny, like, I, I read like some amount of poetry and like it's like a stereotype that in England if you want to be a poet you major in classics at Oxford right because like classics training is for no real reason like the traditional training to like be a writer and to like work with words um and like it would be hard for me to draw a clear line there like I don't think that like I became a stylish writer by reading Greek prose and like, maybe I did in some like oblique way, but like, I, I can't really tell you how. Um, but it is the case that like, people who want to be writers, like some of them are classics majors, right? Some of them, some of them aren't, but like, um, there's a high proportion of people who are classics majors who want to be writers. Um, but then like, I, I would I would put it more strongly than like vocational flair. Like, I do think that like, you know, I graduated from college with like vague dreams of being a writer and had no like way to implement that. And had I implemented it, had I been like, I'm gonna be a writer, I would like sit down and write a bad novel about being like a college student or something, right? Because like, what did I know? Um, but instead I like went off and spent a decade doing boring, I mean, not boring, I, I enjoyed it, but like doing like uh, business things or whatever. And at the end of that, I knew things. And when I sat down to write, I could write about things that I knew and like worlds that I understood and that I could elucidate to other people who didn't understand them. Um, or did for that matter and that was like that was sort of empowering and i worry like you know like 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 it is helpful if you want to be a writer to have something to say and uh it is helpful to have something to say about like you know the world as it exists and and like learning about the world by like having a job is, is helpful for that so uh uh 
So, so I mean, I do think that like day to day, like my work at Goldman and Wachtel was like way more formative for my writing than like my reading Greek poetry. Um, but I also, you know, I like the Greek poetry. So, so obviously your life, you know, takes all those uh, twists and turns that made you a better writer. So I guess even listening to what you were saying before, can one say that you wouldn't have been as good of a journalist without the law and finance experience? And therefore, if, if anyone wants to be a journalist eventually, why, why should they start as a journalist when, when they should be able to first gain some deeper industry knowledge or unique insights working as a practitioner first? So, so if, if my ultimate goal is to become a better writer, then it sounds like starting just as a writer is, is a terrible idea. Well, yeah, I mean, there are different kinds of writing and there are different kinds of journalism. Like, I do think that, like, a lot of the journal, you know, a lot of, like, the reporters that I work with at Bloomberg are, like, people who wanted to be reporters. And they, like, worked on their college newspaper and they graduated and became reporters. And the specific, like, content of their job is, like, not, is, like, not often sort of um, subject matter. Content, Analytical, but it's, like, per se, yeah. It's, like, it's, like, it's reporting skills and, like, the ability to, like, yeah think of a story and frame a story and like get quotes and all, and like, you know, investigate things and all this stuff. And like, that is a skill set that um, I don't have at all. And I would be, and you know, like maybe I could learn it, but I, it seems hard, you know, and like there are people who are good at it and there are people who are good at it through both like a combination of natural talent and like working on it. Um, I do think that like specifically the line of work that I'm in, which is like opinionating or whatever, I don't, I don't even, you yeah, know, what do you do? <laughs> I work for Bloomberg Opinion. I don't think of myself as having particularly strong yeah. opinions. Um, but like, you know, like analytical and descriptive and like explanatory yeah. work. I do think it's, like, I do think that like people with industry knowledge are underrepresented in that line of work and are often like highly advantaged in it. And I do think that there are a number of financial journalists, um, some of them on the sort of more opinion side and some of them on the more like reporting and investigative side and some of them sort of doing both. Um, who have a few years at investment banks and and profit immensely from that in terms of like knowing what's going on, being able to ask the right questions and frame stories in a way that like that like sort of correctly captures their economic reality. Um, I'm not like the only one, you know. Like I think there are a lot, and and it is often an advantage. So maybe we should talk about your newsletter. I mean, we we've had 20 minutes of conversation, basically assuming most of our listeners know about you and and they come here for you, but. Uh, you, you write this newsletter called Money Stuff. And, and just, just if you've never I'm... read it, it'd be a little weird to listen to. Maybe not. Yes, yeah, so for the first 20 minutes. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> you, you have such a unique writing style. I mean, that, that um, it's unparalleled. I don't even know how to describe it. I mean, for, for example, today is June 17th, and you just sent out this newsletter uh, two minutes before you got on the, this call. And, and yeah. the way you started the newsletter is here's the theory you run a bank, and a smallish public company comes to you and asks you to lend it. Say, Five hundred million dollars. You say, okay, I will need to know more about your revenue and expenses and assets. I mean, who writes like this? It's such a casual way. You, you frame things in in first person or second person, and and uh, very casually. You, you, you don't follow the traditional kind of syntaxes that journalism ha has to has to follow. And and so it's oh, a yeah. it's a very, well, it, I, I, <laughs> right. Like like one thing that that was helpful about my spending 10 years or whatever not doing journalism is that I learned a certain subject matter expertise. The other thing is I didn't learn journalism style, right? And like, you know, I don't like, like, I don't like the stylistic influences are to some extent, like, um, you know, I worked at a bank, I explained things to people by email. And like, when I was explaining things to people on my desk, like we made fun of each other all the time, but also wanted to explain things. And like, the, the sort of essential tone there of being like second person and jokey, but also like, as clear as you can, uh, like is some of it. But the other thing is like, you know, like, I, you know, I worked at desk jobs and I read like Gawker, you know, like old school Gawker and like, um, and deal and like old school deal breaker before I worked there. Um, and like, you know, there is like a sort of web style that grew up as a, um, almost like counterweight to like journalistic style. And, uh, you know, like, you're sitting at a desk and you read like an article in the newspaper and it's like, it sounds a certain way. And then you go read Gawker and you're like, this is more fun, right? And so, you know, and then I worked, then I went to work at Deal Breaker, which was like very self-consciously like fun and gossipy and sweary and jokey. And so I like, um, you know, got to put that style into, into you know, I got to attempt that style. Did, did people ever force, were you ever 
implicitly or, or explicitly pressure to, to reframe your voice in a certain way or not, because New York Times did a big profile on you last October and it said uh, it took Mr. Levine exactly one week to find his voice. That's probably an exaggeration. But, but no, I mean, <laughs> what, what that refers to is that, you know, I went to Deal Breaker, which was, which was at the time and for, for a time before and after run by Bess Levin, who's this like great comedic genius of financial writing. And who had at various points had various sidekicks, you know, who were like the second writer of Dealbreaker. And so I came to be her sidekick. And I think that like, in general, if you're her sidekick, like your thought is, I'm going to try to write like Bess Levin because she's a genius and everyone loves her. Um, and uh, I did that. And, you know, Bess's reaction was like, you're doing an okay job of writing like me, but you really shouldn't be trying to write like me. Um, which is probably generous. I wasn't really doing an okay job of writing like her, but um, uh, she's like, you should be writing like yourself. And did it take me a week to find my voice? I don't know, like I'm still sort of finding my voice, but like what did happen is that after a week, I stopped so self-consciously trying to write like best. And I wrote some like technical thing about some option, I don't know, some finance thing. And instead of like trying to make jokes that best would make, I tried to like make jokes about this finance thing. And I was like, oh, this is fun. And then people liked it. And I was like, okay, this is the thing I should be trying to do. And, uh, you know, not that I immediately uh, mastered it, but I did like stop trying to like write like Bess and started trying to figure out what writing like me would sound like. So when we look at financial journalism as an industry as a whole, a lot of people criticize it for just having so much noise. I, I, in the same Taleb, I mean, a lot of those public intellectuals or investors say, I mean, you should never watch CNBC if you actually want to understand what's going on. And how, how much do you think, how noisy is financial journalism? Do you ever look at your daily newsletter and, and go, maybe I should write less frequently, maybe once a week, once a month, maybe long-term um, themes, maybe less know, reaction? It's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, um, like, like, for example, yesterday was Wednesday, June 16th, Jerome Powell had their whole big conference, uh, conference, uh, press conference for the FOMC meeting and then financial times, the, the top four headlines was like UX stocks pulled back from record levels ahead of Fed statement. And then it says Wall Street stocks staged late rally ahead of Fed meeting. And then it says, Global stocks hit all time high as, as I mean, you, you see, you see all those headlines constantly. Oh, markets go up, markets go down. Market actually did this, market actually did that. So you, you go, what is actually happening? And so that's why I guess people really appreciate your voice, but to, yeah, to what I extent? Mean, I, you, you, you feel guilty. I didn't write about the Fed today. I felt, I, I felt like I should probably have something to say about the Fed, but I didn't <laughs> no. like, like the nice thing, and particularly the nice thing about working at, at Bloomberg, which is a giant organization is like someone, you know, like 12 other people are going to write analysis, like, both like reports and also like good analyses of every aspect of the Fed decision. And so I can just skip it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, uh, you know, like there are different purposes served by different things. Um, I think that like, clearly there is a need for some people to know that the market went up or down and like what people are saying about the explanation for it is, uh, that's not my job, you know, like I don't, like I do write every day and I do definitely um, feel like I'm pretty responsive to like, particularly the nonsense news of the day. Um, like I'm not writing like meditations on timeless themes every day. Yeah. Um, but I do feel kind of like I'm writing meditations on timeless themes every day. Like I do, like, I don't care if the market went up or down. Like I've written, you know, in my life, probably five posts that were like, the market crashed a lot yesterday. Let's talk about that. Right. Because like occasionally it happens and you're like, oh, I really need to. Like the only thing people are talking about today is that the market crashed a lot yesterday, so I should say something about that. Um, but like pretty rarely. Um, mostly I like write about things that I think are fun and interesting. And, and usually things that are fun are interesting because they illuminate some deeper theme, right? Where like um, there's some story that you can tell that like is more interesting than just like uh, the like some stock went down, right? Um, uh, like the frequency with which I write is like driven by my own abilities to like, I feel like it would be harder for me to write once a week than once a day. Um, but the, like, I'm not particularly interested in like, I'm not particularly interested in like the financial news of the day. I'm, I'm like interested in using news hooks to elucidate things that I think are more interesting. So you, you mentioned you don't write meditations on timeless themes, but it seems that there is 
a few underlying big themes that, that you write about. And as you said, you, you use interesting examples yeah. and day-to-day -day happenings to illuminate them. So maybe we should talk about some of these. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's security <clears throat> frauds, there's uh, ESG, the GameStop saga, Bitcoin, Tesla, Elon Musk, so, so much stuff. So maybe we should Is do- Is GameStop a timeless theme? I don't know, like it might be, <laughs> right? Like in a hundred years, people might be like, well, this is like when finance was revolutionized by GameStop, right? Like it's possible. I don't know. It's it does should, strike should we... me as being a little bit unlike anything else, but I don't know. <laughs> why, why, why don't we just start there then? I mean, the okay. GameStop saga. I, mean, I think when things first unfolded, which was late January, early February, you actually just came back from your uh, parental leave. Uh, you just had a child and you actually just came back. I, I remember one of the first uh, newsletters that you wrote about was about the GameStop. Uh, saga. Um, what, what, yeah, the, I guess the, that's right. I feel like I came back in early January or like mid-January maybe. And then like GameStop was like two weeks later. Yeah. <laughs> GameStop was like the end of January. Yeah. And, and I feel like uh, nobody really, I mean, you explained the situation so clearly. I mean, you, you analyzed the order flows, you, you showed the complex relationships <laughs> between different parties. I mean, there the, the were the hedge fund guys, there was the Robin Hood's tech company, there were the traders. I mean, I guess the, the two questions immediately on my mind was, what do you think actually happened? And how did you piece things together when when nobody I mean, seems to know what's like, going on? You know, like I'm like a dork who's had like a couple of like stupid niche interests as a financial writer. So like I used to build equity derivatives. I know a little bit about like, you know, options gamma and like no one cares. And I never write about that. And like I for a while was writing about like market structure and like, you know, payment for order flow and like, you know market like internalization and market making and nobody cares about that either. i mean people care about that deeply but there's like 12 of them like people get so angry about it but like no one reads it you know um so these are like two like bizarre niches that i like wrote about sometimes um and then gamestop became like the biggest story in the world and like was like good morning america was about it every day like not the biggest story <laughs> in the financial like the biggest story in the world for like three days and it's like a story i mean it's not really a story about like payment for order flow yeah. and options gamma but it's a little bit of story about payment for order flow and options yeah. gamma. and so all of these like you know like nightly news anchors are like what do i need to know about options gamma and i'm like oh, uh, options gamma. <laughs> um, so it's like uh i don't know i mean like like it just so happens that like this incredibly stupid incredibly huge story like touched on some of my interests. Now I should say it didn't touch on all my interests. And like I still don't feel like I have a good handle on like like the social dynamics of Reddit, you know? Um, which is like what really it was about, not like options gala. Um, but like I could certainly write about it and uh and try to say interesting things about it. Um, what really happened? I don't know, man. I, I think it is still a deeply mysterious situation. Like there's like a sort of shallow level of mystery, which is like uh who pushed up the prices, right? So like one thing that I did write about was like um, there is evidence that it was not like one-sided retail order for buying GameStop shares, right? There's evidence of like a lot of the, a lot of the sort of like basic narratives, like there's evidence that would suggest that they're not that true. So like, um, uh, did like retail people like buy all the shares? Like, well, some retail was selling, some retail was buying, like on net, they were like selling a little bit in those days. So it's like hard to know. Um, uh, did you know? Did options trading? Did like hedging of options by options market makers? Like you know, retail by, uh, retail investors bought call options that were out of the money, and that causes options market makers to buy stock, and then to buy more stock as the stock goes up. Did that move the price a lot? Uh, like there's evidence that the answer is not so much, but you know, who knows? Um, all these things are less clear, you know. And then like on the other hand. Did a bunch of hedge funds buy GameStop stock to, you know, bet on a short squeeze or to sort of like ride the retail momentum? Like the answer is yes, like clearly. Um, but like, what was the motivating factor in like in the stock moving? Like, I think, I think you have to say it was people on Reddit getting really excited about it all at once in a social way. But like, it's hard to sort of point to hard evidence of that because like again, retail flows weren't one sided, and, and you know. Like the way the stock market works is that like some fundamental thing happens and there is like a sort of like ripple effect where, um, you know, like some person buys stock for that fundamental reason. And then like a bunch of algorithms are like, ooh, the stock went up, I should buy some, right? And so like there are a lot of, a lot of like knock-on effects of like fundamental or, or, or not fundamental things, right? Knock-on effects of just like emotional things. 
Um, and I think clearly like that played a role here as it plays a role in every day's trading for every stock. Um, but like, that doesn't explain why it went from, you know, four to 400 or whatever, right? Like, like, and I don't know what it does, but you know, the sort of shallow surface explanation of like people on Reddit liked the stock and decided to buy it seems to be more correct than like some like shadowy conspiracy theory explanation, I think. So, so in some sense, when you looked at that, did you feel like it was a new story, an old story? And, and by that, I mean, certain people in the financial industry, I mean, we had Ben Hunt who writes uh, Epsilon Theory, another finance blog. I mean, he, he was saying that this is nothing new, you know, narrative has always uh, been very important in the media, in, in hedge fund managers, and it was uh, not what the media was portraying. And there were people, uh, investors were, and journalists were writing that this was a very watershed moment for the industry, the, the anti-neoliberal, anti-establishment populist sentiment really culminated to su such a eruption point, and it was a inflection point for, for Wall Street. And so, so I mean... Um, I don't, I mean... Uh... Like, if you ask you this in like the beginning of February, I'd say, look, pumps are a thing, right? Like bubbles are a thing, like stocks go up for no reason, then they go down again, right? Um, like people, unsophisticated investors getting excited about a, like a stock and, and having its value go up too high and not being corrected for some reason of like limits to arbitrage. I think that's a pretty old story. Um, short sellers getting squeezed is a pretty old story. Um, I don't know, like the populism thing struck me as a uh, tenuous explanation for this. I think that most people doing this wanted to make money or have fun or both rather than like bring down the hedge funds or whatever. Although there's a certain amount of talking about bringing down the hedge funds. Um, but uh, what I will say is like two things. One is that like, like you can have like sort of um, like distributed phenomena where like uh, a bunch of people all get excited about a stock and buy it and it goes up a lot. And like, that's a pretty old story. Um, and you can have like coordinated phenomena where like some, some whale, like, you know, some big hedge fund or whatever buys a lot of a stock and pushes it up and like manipulates it in some way. But GameStop was, was kind of new in that it was like, both of those things at once. Like it was, instead of being a hedge fund being the whale, it was like thousands of individual retail traders who found a way to coordinate. Um, and I don't say that in a like derogatory or like, like people say coordinate, they're like, oh, it's collusion, it's illegal. It's like some sort of market manipulation. I don't think that really. Um, people thought that a lot in like January. And I think that that talk has faded because like, it seems pretty clear that nobody did anything particularly illegal. Um, but yeah, like they all got together on a message board and they like found a way to coordinate um, and to all buy the same stock at once in a way that was not just like coincidental or like in the zeitgeist, but the way that was like specifically discussed and agreed on, not agreed on, it's specifically discussed and like, you know, they like shared tips for how to like use options gamma to make the stock go up. Uh, so that was new and interesting. And I think that like, the fact that retail traders can and do coordinate in such a powerful way uh, does seem new. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, again, if you ask me in like early February, is this new? Like, yeah, stocks go up, stocks go down, there are bubbles, who cares? There are pumps, who cares? Because it felt like a pump, right? Um, now, like, you know, months later, the stock is still really high and, and the whole thing just seems more enduring. And I think it's weirder. And do you story, still believe in the efficient market hypothesis now <laughs> after seeing that? Well, I don't, I mean, efficient markets, <laughs> efficient markets. Um, I, like, I've never believed in a form of the EMH that is like companies, stock prices accurately reflect their future cash flows, right? I believe in like the form of the EMH that is like, you will have a hard time picking stocks that go up. Um, supposedly Eugene Fama uh, would say to his students, the market is efficient for you which is, I think, a good way of putting it. Um, <laughs> but uh, 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 the story that I go to is like, um, you know, like 20 years ago, there was like a double in like tech stocks, right? And like people thought that the cash flows of tech stocks would be higher than they turned out to be, or like many of them. Not, you know, also like there was Amazon, right? And the cash flows there turned out to be 
higher than people thought. But um, you know, like valuations on a lot of tech companies were too high. Um, and if you ask people what they were, what they thought they were doing in like 1999, they were like, we think the cash flows of these companies will be really high. And then like, they turned out not to be. And that's like, you know, that's thousands of years of financial history goes like that, right? Um, in, 20, in 2021, um, I don't know, like you can talk to some GameStop bulls and they're like, we think the cash flows of this company will be really high. We think it'll have a really good, you know, like Brian Cohen will do a turnaround and they'll sell stock, they'll sell games online and blah, 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 this cash flows will be really high. Like you can definitely read that case, right? Um, but like you definitely also get a lot of people who are like, Diamond Hands, GameStop to a thousand, just like for social or whatever reasons with, with like no interest in cash flows. And I think that one thing that is different is that um, Bitcoin was invented like whatever it is a decade ago. Um, and like the thing that, there, like there's a lot going on with Bitcoin, but like a basic thing about Bitcoin is like, you had this thing that was worth zero dollars. It was like a thing that like a guy wrote a paper about. And then people are like, oh, this, like people coordinated around it. And like the sheer social fact of them coordinating around it made it worth, you know, $4 and then, you know, 40,000 or $60,000, right, um, over time. And people saw that and, you know, obviously like part of why Bitcoin is valuable is for sort of technological reasons and, uh, and you know, whatever. But like, like a big part of it is that like this sheer sort of social coordination ability turned out to be valuable, which is not exactly a new thing, right? Like the reason the US dollar can be used to buy sandwiches is because we have like a social coordination mechanism that says we're gonna attribute value to this piece of paper, right? But that's like a very like old and complicated government like, backed sort of background like social yeah. coordination, right? It's like, oh we have a government, right? Right. But Bitcoin, it was but like we're gonna like completely. get people on the web and they're gonna coordinate yeah. to attract attribute value to this thing and then it's gonna have value. Yeah. And then people are like, well if you do that, you can do it like as many times as you want. And so people invented like Dogecoin and shit. And like all these things like had value because like people like some community, not everyone on earth, not everyone in some like country, but like some community on the internet coordinated around them was like, we're going to attribute value to them. And the value is going to be sh like sheerly our willing, like our continued durable willingness to exchange them for value rather than anything to do with underlying cash flows or whatever. And once you've established that, like you can apply it to stock, why not? <laughs> <laughs> you can be like, and GameStop is the new Dogecoin, right? Yeah. And I think that like, I don't think that like people like consciously articulated that as they were buying it, but I think that like the proof of concept of like, you can like create value like purely socially that, that Bitcoin really like foregrounded. I think, um, I think that proof mattered a lot to um, uh, a lot of like meme finance generally in ways that are novel and we're really still figuring out because like you know the you know like GameStop is going to announce earnings every three months right and like if it like has this amazing turnaround then like then like this is not an important story right um because uh people bet on it having an amazing turnaround and they were right right and if it doesn't have an amazing turnaround and it just like continue and it just has bad earnings and the stock goes back down to like two dollars or whatever then this is also not that interesting a story, right? It's like people bet on an amazing turnaround and they were wrong. And like that happens all the time too. Um, but like one thing that's happened is like, it's been like, you know, five months and like it hasn't like exactly had an amazing, but it's, you know, it's, it's way too early to tell, right? Like they're doing things, like they've sort of replaced the whole executive suite and like they're trying to have an amazing turnaround. But like at some point, you know, five years from now, if GameStop has bad earnings and the stock is at $400, you're, you're like, what, what's going on here? what's going on so i don't know so, so how do you price all this in because it, it seems I like uh, do, do you think we're just in a structurally different era where right, for example it seems like all you need to to do well, is like i don't know like like what how would you intelligently invest in gamestop right like you're right if, if you like if you look at gamestop and you're like i have a faith in this management team that they are going to uh build this company's business such that its cash flows are worth two thousand dollars a share then great buy the stock right um, if you think, you know, what's the stock at now? If you like look at this manager team and you're like, uh, this 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 team is great, this company is good, they're gonna do a good job, 
and the stock is going to be worth $100 a share, which is like, you know, way above where it was at the start of the year. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a 225 now, right? So, um, so what do you do there? You're like, well, it's a, it's a short on valuation, right? I think it's a good company that isn't worth $205. So I'm going to sell it short. Like, that's a crazy thing to do, right? That's like very traditional, but it'd be crazy to do it, right? You're going to get short squeeze. It's going to go to a million dollars. Like, you know, you can't trade that. Um, and so like, I think that like, it's, you know, I think some number of professionals are trading these stocks in some way that is more or less meme driven, right? It's more, you know, it's either like consciously, like I'm going to make some prediction about what Reddit traders will do, or it's like, we have a momentum driven algorithm and we're gonna, you know, use that or whatever, or, or you know, like the professionals who are making the most money on GameStop are like Citadel, right? It's like the people who are just market making in this thing. And it's like bouncing around wildly and they're, they're sort of putting a spread on it. Um, so like there is there are professional trades to be done, but like you're just like a like a long term value investor, you know. Like look at their holder list. Like they had a bunch of like long term value investors, and they all got out because it's like, what, like how do you how do you like make a how, how do you price decision? these? Things? But well, but the, but the thing is, this is like infinite order game theory because rational investors should understand that Tesla and Bitcoin are bound to be bigger than their fundamentals because of the narrative surrounding them, and then. People would say, but once you recognize that, that's like the second order to it and the third order. Yeah, that's to right. It. I mean, I, I, I agree. Right. With you. Like some people are good at this, right? Like some people, like clearly, there are some professionals who are like, I have some theory of like GameStop's cash flows and like Reddit social dynamics and how those things interact. And my theory tells me my price target is like. 275 so i should buy or 175 so i should, I should short and some people are like you know have, have like enough of a theory and enough confidence in that theory that they can do it um but it is definitely and, and obviously like you know if you were investing five years ago like you were doing something like that right like you were doing some combination of like i'm going to think about the fundamentals of this company i'm also going to think about market dynamics in some form right like market psychology in some form the form has changed i think like i think it's it's, you know, like what's happening on Reddit is different from like how you would characterize market psychology five years ago. But like, you know, if you're good at your job, like you, you change with the times. Um, but it's it's above my pay grade. Like I, I would be, I would be very, very nervous to be like a, you know, concentrated value investor with a position right now, one way or the other in GameStop. Not, not anywhere. Like, I don't think that like everything is meme stocks now, um, but uh there are certain pockets of the market that you should uh, steer away from. Yeah, and I think they're um, I think they're like a little bit hard to identify, right? And I think like like yeah. one thing that I've written about like half jokingly is that like like one of those pockets is like stocks that are heavily shorted, which is like a problem if you're like a short seller or like a long short fund. Like anything you short is like a you know like your risk is not just that like you're wrong or whatever or that like it gets acquired. Your risk is that it'll shoot up, you know, ten thousand percent because people are mad at short sellers and like, like it will become detached from rational value. Um, and I don't know how common that is. Like, it's not like every stock that is shorted has like a crazy short squeeze, but it's like you know, people got really carried out on the GameStop short, and like I think that I think if and, and you know after that, like a number of like professional short sellers expressed their nervousness and were like, we're gonna stop shorting for a while or something like that. Do you think we're in a bubble right now? I mean, because it seems like we're in a structurally different place. There's a lot of narratives and, and it's hard to have a hypothesis about what's going to bring this down because it's, you can't really short a technological innovation that doesn't have earnings or something because there's no way you can disprove the hypothesis that this is going to be a long-term uh, because there's that subjective psychological conviction that people have that this is just going to keep going up or, or whatever. I mean, wh whether, whether you talk about certain tech stocks or s certain innovations like crypto, right? There's no way you can disprove that decentralized finance, DeFi is in the future, you, but, but you also don't know what they're actually doing. So you kind of look at the space and you, it's just very weird, right? Yeah, I mean, or, like, you know, like, um, you know, you look at like the, like the, you know, late 90s, 2000 tech bubble and like, you know, it's like a tech bubble, right? Like things went up and then they went down, but it's also, it's like a period that produced a lot of like important innovative companies, right? Um, and like, you could imagine something similar here where like, where like a certain amount of froth in the market 
is what enables capital raising for wacky ideas, some of which turned out to be world changing ideas, right? Like, I don't know. Um, uh, uh, like, I think DeFi is really cool. And I think every actual project that I read about makes me like <laughs> want to shoot myself. But, um, <laughs> you know, like that's, you know, I don't know. Like, that's, um, that's like, uh, uh, that's like how it works, right? Like there's like a, an ecosystem of like, you know, 90% fraud and 10% innovation. Um, you know, right. or like, look at like, you know, the electric vehicle companies, like any actual article you read about an electric vehicle SPAC is like, oh, that's a fraud. Um, but uh, should we be funding research into electric vehicles? Like, yeah, that, that seems like very socially valuable. Um, and, you know, the sort of traditional financial capitalist way to fund it is for a bunch of people to raise money and like hire a bunch of smart engineers and like create incentives for people to get into that space. And the ones who get into that space and succeed will get very rich. And the ones who get into that space and fail will like get hilariously rich, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, like, it's a good, it's a good, you know, like I think in like 20 years, if, if like, if like we're polluting all that less because everything's electric, people are going to look back and be like, it's bizarre that we used internal combustion cars and it's great that we fixed that. And, uh, you know, so there were a few frauds, who cares, right? Like, I don't know. <laughs> so, so I was having lunch with Professor Tyler Cowen, who, who I believe interviewed you uh, on his uh, conversation with Tyler podcast. And he was saying that, uh, I mean, he's a longtime colleague, Alex Tabarik. They're all very bullish on uh, the crypto future, blockchain technology, DeFi. And uh, I, was, I was just saying that there's a lot of fraud. And Professor Cowan was saying, you should be looking for the frauds. I mean, that's where the... What, or the changes where the action is happening, but but it sounds like it goes back to what we we're saying before, which is that yeah, I'd mean, be like a little careful on that because like like one thing that DeFi does is like right. it's a really like good enabling mechanism for like 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 literal pyramid schemes. Like like a few years ago, like when sort of if, like you know like like in the early days of like you know kind of like like second generation crypto stuff, like you'd go to like look at like crypto projects and they're all like pyramid scheme would be like the name of the project. And they'd be like, <laughs> what this is, is like you put they in a token you. and then people who put in tokens later, you get a, you know, like it was just like literally like explicitly open, you know, Ponzi and pyramid schemes um, because uh, they, they make up their order flows on the exchanges. And no, they, no, they, it was just like, it was just like, it was just like, it's just chain letters. It was just like, we'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. And if you get in at the right time, you'll make money. If you're at the wrong time, you'll lose like whatever you put in, which is not, you know, your life savings. And like, that was, that was it. Like, it was just like, you can do a pyramid scheme. And so like a lot of the innovation, like was, was like, <laughs> here's a new way to do a pyramid scheme. So I don't know, there's other stuff too, but like, uh, I'd be careful in saying, you know, the fraud is where the innovation is because like, uh, There are a lot of old frauds that like, it's like the innovation is like not getting arrested for them. <laughs> like if you just revive the old frauds, it's like, oh, you know. I mean, my, my friend sent me this thing that, that was like doing online casino in virtual reality yeah. using cryptocurrencies on a DeFi block blockchain. Like that's I mean, innovative, but things. like, you know, who cares? What, what is <laughs> going on? I mean, how is this thing not? I mean, I mean, I can, I can see why people would be incentivized to use certain innovations or, but, but don't you look at these things and you go, this is a joke. This is what, whatever that is happening. Yeah, I mean, like, I think the knock on DeFi is that it is mainly uh, at this point, a, uh, a like um, a venue for self-referential speculation, right? And there's not a lot of like, um, like people are not building factories and financing them with, with like DeFi. With, with DeFi, right. Like, like you, it's hard to point to a real world object that was funded by DeFi. But, you know, I think the counter argument is like, if you make a really good system for trading financial claims, and then you like go to people who issue financial claims to fund real projects, and you're like, look at our really good system for trading financial claims. Maybe they'll come, you know, like we build the system first, which is, which is the opposite of how traditional finance was built, right? Which traditional finance, like, kept optimizing the system for trading financial claims 
that started from like, you know, issuing financial claims to fund real world projects. Um, but, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't like prove that the DeFi approach is wrong, right? Like if you do, like, like the problem with the, like an arguable problem with the DeFi approach is that because it is sort of so hermetically sealed from the real world, like you're optimizing exciting gambling rather than like the trading of financial claims, like the, like the, the optimization in a world constrained by like your financial claims fund real world projects is going to be different from the optimization of like your pure abstract claims. But I don't know, like you build a really good exchange, like maybe someone will list their stock on it. And you see some of that, right? Like, you know, they wouldn't say that like a lot of companies have listed their stocks on decentralized exchanges, but like you see like, you see like DeFi curious companies, right? And like, I, I think that, you know, I think that like, I don't think that there's, I think there's promise to that, you know, it's like, it hasn't really yet been achieved, but it's early days. We used the word uh, fraud many times in this, uh, in this interview, and you write about securities fraud a lot and everything is securities fraud, which is uh, one of the taglines that you're, you're famous for. Um, how, would you mind telling us a little bit more about the idea that everything security frauds because, because there's some very interesting observations you made over the years, you know, on climate change, sexual harassment, you know, they, they can all be tied back to securities fraud. Yeah, so the idea is that if you're a US public company, you have to like say stuff about yourself, you have to disclose things. Um, so you write like quarterly reports in eight Ks and whatever. Um, and if you say something wrong, you get sued for securities fraud. And it turns out that like anything bad that happens to a company, you can point to something in their disclosure and be like, they said something wrong there. Um, so like, you know, if a company gets hacked, you go look at its disclosure and there's a risk factor that's like, we might get hacked and that would be bad. And you say, well, you said you might get hacked, but you didn't say you would get hacked, right? Um, or like, you know, if a company's executive like if company's chief executive officer does sexual harassment, somewhere on the company's website, there's gonna be a code of conduct that is like, we'll behave nicely. And you'll be like, you have this code of conduct. Investors bought shares thinking that you would behave nicely, but in fact, you didn't. Um, so there's always something like that you can point to that, that like is, a, is some claim about the company that didn't, that like arguably didn't sufficiently warn investors that the bad thing was happening or would happen. Uh, and, uh, you know, it turns out that like, if a bad thing happens in the company and the stock goes down and you can call it securities fraud, you can put together a class of all the people who owned the shares before they went down. And then you can say, these people lost the number of shares they held times the amount it went down, which is like hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. And then you sue and you have some vaguely colorable claim that's like, well, you know, like, this, like you didn't disclose, you know, you said in your code of conduct that you were gonna be able. And so the company settles it for like, you know, one cent on the dollar or 10 cents or something. And that's like tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. And, you know, the lawyers get a third of it. And so there's an enormous incentive for lawyers to uh, find those cases. And they're like easy to find because anytime a stock goes down, you're like, got to be securities fraud. Um, so stock goes down by 10%, 400 lawyers race to be the one to, uh, to, to lead this case and get paid millions of dollars for settling it. Um, and, uh, you know, meanwhile, like the underlying thing, you know, like there, there are sexual harassment cases where like the company is accused of like pervasive, like a pervasive practice of, of sexual harassment and like some lawyers take on those cases and the company says, well, you can't like certify a class because each particular case of sexual harassment is different. Right. And like, you can't say all of these victims were like sexually harassed in the same way. And so there's a lot of argument about that and it goes back and forth. And like, then you say, what are the damages, right? Like, like, you know, like it's bad to be sexually harassed, but how do you quantify the damages of that? Whereas like the securities case, it's like, you can easily certify a class because the stock went down. So everyone owned the stock as the class. And what are the damages? Well, the stock went down. So it's that amount of money. And that amount of money, by the way, is enormous, right? Like in a big company, if it goes down by 5%, that's hundreds of millions of dollars. And so these are very easy cases relative to like, the, like suing directly for the underlying thing. And so like they become, you know, you sometimes see, people have, like lawyers have more success and get more money from bringing a securities fraud case premised on sexual harassment than the people bringing the underlying security, the underlying sexual harassment case. 
And so, you know, everything gets transmuted into securities fraud where to the point where like, you don't even bother suing over the pollution or the sexual harassment or whatever. You just go straight to the securities case. And I think, and I think another additional consequence of that is that uh, even politicians would sometimes go after companies or, or issues, not for the underlying issues per se, but using regulated financial regulators to, to get the company yeah, to change and like that is like over security. Of, you know, and so like you see that in like, um, you know, like you, you see some of that in like environmental stuff where like uh, Exxon or you get a lot of like it would be very high profile if like you know the EPA or Congress passed rules saying you know fossil fuel companies can't drill oil or whatever right like these are like incredibly salient high profile politically controversial issues. Um, whereas if you're, a, if you're someone who wants companies to do less drilling for oil, you can say, well, they haven't fully disclosed the like environmental costs of drilling or like the cost to shareholders of like potential future environmental regulation. Uh, and so they're committing securities fraud. You can like have the SEC go after them. You can sue them for securities fraud. It's, uh, it's less salient and still very powerful because like, you know, this, this theory is quite powerful because like, you know, there's billions of dollars in the line. And so, yeah, you do see some of that where like there is an effort to regulate environmental and other sort of like hot button political issues through the SEC rather than through like the substantive agency. That's a bit bizarre, right? I mean, sure. What do you, what do you feel like about my the main point is like it's bizarre. Oh, I don't know. I mean, like, it, 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 constitutionality. I don't know. Like, it's you know, like, like, the reason this theory works is that um, we don't know, have to worry about the, the. No, I mean, the reason this, this theory works is that, like, it's not like untrue that um, shareholders are harmed by the lack of disclosure, right? Um, like, it's weird. Like, it's it's a, it's a weird emphasis. It's weird to say, like, you know, uh, the way that we regulate environmental issues the way that we sort of like vindicate the rights of citizens is by pretending that we're vindicating the rights of shareholders. Like it's just like politically bizarre, but it's not wrong that like shareholders are affected by these things. And so like, there is like, like, I don't, like what's the constitutionality of like punishing companies for saying false things in their securities filings? Like it's pretty well established you can do that. So, you know. so, so what would you do with your, the chairman of the SEC or, or FTC no, if I were the chairman of the SEC, like I might like continue to do the same thing, right? Because like I might be like, well, pollution is bad, we should stop it, right? Um, if I were like dictator of the world, I might be like, you know, we're gonna get the EPA, and the EPA is going to have, you know, a set of pollution regulations that we think are correct, and it's going to enforce those directly. And we're not gonna enforce our pollution goals through securities law because the goal of securities law is to protect shareholders and the goal of pollution regulation is to protect the environment or whatever, right? Um, like if I were a dictator of the world, I would try to address environmental harms through an environmental agency that is specifically tasked with protecting the environment rather than through a, a securities agency that is tasked with protecting financial markets. But I'm not dictator of the world, I'm not chairman of the SEC either, but if I were chairman of the SEC, I might be like, well, protecting the environment is good and the EPA isn't going to do it for institutional reasons. So I will, right? Like, I don't think that's an unreasonable position, but it's a weird one. Do, do you think it's an unreasonable position for, you know, there are people who support modern monetary theory or a little bit more activist politicians who say the Federal Reserve should actively support climate change by pushing for certain policies or so on. I mean, if yeah, we look at idea, Congress, right? right? I mean, it's exactly. Like you, have, you have levers to push and like, there's yeah. like a big red lever that says EPA, right? And like, right. if you touch that one, someone will smack you. But there's like all these other levers and you can do Levers that you can just you know? do. <laughs> so you feel fine doing the, I mean- No, I think it's weird. I, mean, I, write, I write that it's weird. I, I think it's like a bad way to set up a system, right? It's a bad, it says bad things about American governance that like, that's how we do the governance, but it's also like a rational response to a second best world, right? Like, I don't, yeah. like, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I mean, like, I don't know. I, I have trouble criticizing it too much. So what do you think of, what, what do you think of this whole ESG 
uh, trend that, that we've been seeing right now. I, I mean, I still remember reading your piece, ESG stocks are graded on a curve. And that was from like 2019 when you were saying how, yeah. you know, you, you just put, you, you just put a couple ESG companies in your index fund or something and you say, oh, this is the green fund that you should, no, you can it's invest hard. in. Like, like, the, the particular thing I was writing out there is like, you know, there, there are various theories of like what ESG means, right? But like, um, like, like if you think like, like, so like let's say you think coal is bad, right? You think like coal contributes to climate change. One thing you can do is not invest in coal companies. And the theory there would be like, if I don't invest in coal companies, then I'm marginally pushing up the cost of capital of coal. And so coal companies will have a little bit of a harder time financing themselves. And so there will be fewer coal companies and less coal will be dug, right? Or like they'll do fewer projects. Um, and that's like a very traditional financial theory and it makes sense. Um, but on the other hand, it has some problems. One of which is like, you know, if like you divest from coal and no one else does, then like you haven't really pushed the cost of capital that much. Another problem that I think is like, weird and salient, and this I kind of owe to Cliff Asnes who has, who has written this in a, in a clear way. Another problem is that like, if this is your theory that you're pushing up the cost of capital of coal, then what that means is that you're pushing up the returns on people who, for people who invest in coal, right? The cost of capital is higher, that means the return on investment is higher. Um, and if that's what you're doing, then you're like, we're going to sacrifice returns and let those coal investors have those returns in order to push up the, the cost of coal projects. And like, that might be morally good, but it's a tough sell, right? Like it's a tough sell. And like usually ESG funds are like, we outperform non-ESG funds. So it's like a tough sell to be like, we're gonna push up the cost of capital of coal. So that's one thing you do is just divest from coal. Another thing you can do is be like, we're gonna buy out the stock in all the coal companies and we're gonna have meetings with them because we're their biggest shareholders now. And we're gonna yell at them to stop digging so much coal or whatever, or like to dig it in a cleaner way or to transition to solar energy or whatever, right? And that's like, um, like who does that? Like, is that BlackRock's approach? Like, not exactly, but like a little bit, like a little bit, like their approach is like, we're gonna own every company, but we're gonna like, like you know, yell at them if they do bad things. And so, <laughs> and so like, be you better, have yeah. a range of, of approaches where like one approach would be like, I'm gonna buy stock in coal companies and tell them to stop drilling coal, which is a sort of extreme position that will probably lose you a lot of money. Another thing you do is be like, we're gonna buy stock in coal companies and tell them to drill coal in a more responsible way. And like you do see that with like, that is kind of BlackRock's approach to gun companies where they're like, we will own gun companies because we're an index fund. Um, or, you know, I often shorthand it by saying BlackRock is an index fund. Obviously they're not, they're like a giant asset manager that mostly like owns actively managed bonds, but like they do have very large index portfolios. Um, anyway, uh, BlackRock is like, we're gonna buy gun companies, but we're gonna have a meeting with them every quarter and be like, please don't, sell guns to people who are going to shoot up schools right like there's like a um like it's very hard to know what these meetings go like and like it's very awkward for blackrock um because like to some extent blackrock is like sell guns much more responsibly and the gun companies are like no and like, that's the end of it um but uh <laughs> yeah uh but so but that aside like so so one approach is you can do that you can be like we're gonna we're gonna own uh everything we're going to own like the companies we don't like and we're going to tell them to do things that we like more um and then a third approach you can do is we can be like we're going to own coal companies but we're going to own the good companies not own the, own the good coal companies not the bad coal companies in other words we're going to create an incentive for we're going to lower the cost of capital and create an incentive for coal companies that do coal in a more responsible way and uh and punish the coal companies that do coal in an irresponsible way. And the result of that will be that coal companies um, uh, uh, improve their behavior. And so I think this is a sort of like reasonable compromise. Like some people are like, we're gonna divest from coal, but like everyone's like oil is gonna be around for a while. Uh, and so uh, and so some, some number of people are like, we're gonna buy the good oil companies and not the bad oil companies because that's going to create the right incentives in a space that's going to be around for a while. Um, but it does lead to the result that like, if you buy like the, you know, the like stop global warming fund and then you look at its holdings, it's like Exxon and you're like, hmm, that's not what I wanted. Uh, that's what I mean by graded on a curve is that like, 
And like, and so I just describe this in a sympathetic way. The unsympathetic way to describe it would be like, well, what you want as an ESG fund manager uh, is to is to get assets, like to get people to invest in your ESG fund. And the way to do that is to tell them two things. One, you will not suffer in performance relative to the S&P 500. You'll get the return of the S&P 500. And two, we'll do some ESG stuff, right? Because like maybe they don't care. Maybe your investors don't care very much about exactly what the ESG stuff is. So it says ESG on the cover. And so some amount of ESG is like, we're going to own 490 stocks in the S&P 500. We're going to emit like two coal companies and like, we're going to own like the, the good oil are... companies and not the bad oil companies. And like there's yeah. some... There's some adjustment where, like, if you sort of look at the expected returns, it'll be the same as the S and P 500 to within a few basis points. But like, you can be like, we did some mumbo jumbo, and so now it's ESG. Um, and like, that's the cynical view of it. And I think that there's some truth to that uh, because I think that you know a lot of people are genuinely looking for that. They're genuinely looking for the S and P 500 return plus like the thinnest veneer of being told that they're a good person, right? Like, I don't think that, I don't think the investors here are being defrauded, right? I think that they're like, I want to be told that I'm a good person and I want to know the S&P, right? And like, you can, like, that's a product you can give them, so, you know. So do you, I mean, based on your years of uh, talking to people and looking at the data, do ESG funds actually outperform? Uh, I mean, I have never looked at the is, data. I, I mean, we're, 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 in other words, is it actually a good investment? Because I, I talk to certain I fund managers and, and then they say, this, this is, they don't beat the market. And, you know, and then there are other people who say, oh my God, like this is the future, you know, clean well, energy. Look, I, look, I mean, there's, uh, two, there's two views, right? There's the Cliff Asnes view that like the point of ESG is to, is to raise the cost of capital of bad companies. And if you think that, then ESG funds should underperform the market, right? Because they should be buying all the things with low cost of capital and like, and like selling the things that have a high return on investment. Um, the other view is that like ESG is a lever of financial performance that is not captured by some traditional metrics, right? Where like you will have a, you will have um, like, you might have lower cash flows in the next five years by like refusing to drill for oil or whatever. But in the long run, your cash flows will be more sustainable because um, you don't, have those yeah. risks like yeah like you don't you know like you don't get like whatever. regulated out of existence yeah. or something right or you don't or like the, the world doesn't turn on you and say we just can't do this anymore so from that perspective you know and like you don't even have to wait for the long term for that right like i mean like to the extent that like people come to realize that and are like ooh, coal is not sustainable but solar is then like the price of solar companies will go up and the price of coal companies will go down and then if you were an investor like an esg focused investor you will make money on a market market basis um and there's, by the way, there's like a third viewpoint, which is like the BlackRock viewpoint, which is like, never mind companies. Like, we own everything. Like, we own the economy. Like, we're an index fund. We own 10% of the market. We're just, the, we're just the economy. And the economy will be better if cities don't get drowned under rising oceans. And so from our investor's perspective, the performance of a company is irrelevant. Like, what is relevant is that the world doesn't end. Right? And like, if you're BlackRock and you're in 10% of the economy, like that's like a reasonable position to take of like, we're the world government now, which I think is like really weird and interesting. Um, but, uh, but also like not, like, like, like a genuinely like reasonable economic position for them to take is like, you know, if, if like we own a bunch of oil companies and they like, uh, they like drown the earth, then like all of our real estate holdings will be screwed. So we should not own oil companies or whatever, right? I mean, or we should own oil companies and yell at them to be better. Um, but so I don't know. I mean, I have no idea what the answer is. And I think that like part of the answer, like, like there's no, um, like you can't answer that in like the short term, you know, like, like either, like, I don't I really don't look at the data, but like either ESG funds have underperformed because they've succeeded in raising the cost of capital of like vice stocks or whatever, or they've overperformed because, um, people have decided to be, have decided that like sustainable companies are have, like have more sustainable cash flows. And so the relative valuation of like sustainable companies has gone up. Um, but neither of those tells you much about like what will happen in the next 20 years, you know? Um, uh, so I don't know the answer. And 
uh, I don't care very much about the answer. I don't think it's very interesting to be like, you know, will your ESG fund, fund outperform by 10 basis points? I think like the interesting question is like, um, are you accomplishing ESG goals by doing this? And that I think is also hard, but I think that like, um, I think that like the, the engine number one proxy fight at Exxon is like super interesting because like it can feel like there is a ton of lip service paid to ESG stuff where like people propose non-binding shareholder resolutions and like companies write reports and like there's like a large um, dance around ESG stuff. And the idea that an activist would conduct a proxy fight saying this gigantic oil company should focus more on renewable energy and win and replace directors and put its directors in the boardroom is like a really new front in ESG, right? Because like when I talk about like BlackRock's engagement or whatever, it's like, yeah, we own oil companies and we go and once a quarter we tell them to be more responsible. And like they, they can put you on mute for that, you know? Um, but then like you're in the boardroom, like that's a different story. So I do think that, um, uh, you know, I think that like the ability of ESG investment to uh, accomplish ESG goals is a more interesting question than it's like financial returns. And I think that there's a lot of reason to be skeptical about that in general because of like, you know, because of like the limitation of shareholder engagement and like, because yeah. of like, the, there's a certain amount of like, we're gonna own all the companies and like tweak the allocations a little bit. But I also think that there's reason to be um, really interested in that and to say that, that like, in fact, shareholders are finding new ways to actually accomplish ESG goals. So, so when it comes to proxy fights or calls for university endowments to divest and, and so on, like how much does those financial moves actually end up impacting climate change? I mean, my, my, my point is, does it really matter at the end of the day when whether, say, Harvard invests in a fossil fuel company or not? I mean, that does that. I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, divestiture is like the classic, like raising the cost of capital argument. And right. um, I, I don't, I mean, there, there is there some margin at which it matters? Maybe. I don't, I mean, like oil companies are not starved for capital because of the divestments of some university endowments, right? Like, I mean, it might matter a little, it can't matter more than a little, unless everyone did it. And then it may it would maybe matter a little medium of that, you know, like oil companies are not, you know, starved for capital, even if, they make money. Um, uh, proxy fights, I don't know. I mean, like we're very early in that, but like that's a potentially really meaningful thing where like- New frontier for, for yeah. the battle. Like, see. like if you like if you have the ability to fire every oil company CEO and yeah. replace them with an environmentalist, like that would be weird, but it would have an effect, <laughs> right? And like, do you have that now? Like, no, like, like engine number one has like fired three oil company directors and replaced them with like energy people. And that's not like, you know, like it's not like, like they haven't done anything crazy, but um, but yeah, it's like meaningful and like but and could have you know more of that could have like significant effects. So uh, I guess you mentioned the word that you're still hopeful. And do you ever become cynical in, in terms of certain topics when, especially when you're in finance for so long, when you sure. look at these trends for so long? I feel like I'm cynical about everything. <laughs> yes, please. What what are what are the parts that you're cynical about? Oh, I don't know. Everything. I mean, like I feel like my take on the ESG is a little bit cynical, right? I mean, like it's like. Like you're a little bit jaded, whatever. I mean, starting from the premise that people want the S and P, but to be told that they're good people is like a fairly cynical approach to yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, like, you know, I think if you talk to a lot of people in, in in decentralized finance, they'd be like, "We're reinventing the you know the world of finance and making the world freer." And I'm like, "Yeah, it's like gambling tokens." Um, I don't know. I'm still pretty cynical <laughs> about everything. Um, yeah. Like the securities fraud stuff is very cynical. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. What's the point of finance or derivatives? I mean, you worked on derivatives for a long time. Aren't they just kind of, um, it's the kind of financial innovations that on paper or in theory seem to lead to better risk management and so on. But it seems to be the financial innovations that is simply about making credit easier to access, getting more people into the financial economy, getting the democracy more involved in the financial economy, and the economy becomes more financialized and fragile. 
Um, or maybe that's. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, look at DeFi, right? I mean, like, what, so like. Part of me wants to make like a consumer choice argument of like um, people want risks and we can give them to them, right? And like if you look at like you know look around, right? Like like like, um, like people want the GameStop risk, right? Like and they get it, and like that's not like no one at Goldman Sachs was like we're going to invent a GameStop, right? Like that's just people want want their own want the risks that they want, and you know a bank will give you all sorts of risks that you want, and you know you look at DeFi and it's like they start from a place of like, let's build derivatives exchanges, right? Like traditional finance started from the other place of like, let's help companies build factories. And it turns out that like, if you want to build a factory, you might borrow money, right? And then like, you can borrow fixed or floating, right? And like, maybe there, there's a market segmentation reason that you want to borrow like, you know, from floating rate lenders, but you really want to fix your interest expense because you don't want to take the risk of the interest rate floating. And so you're like, oh, I'll buy a swap. And then you're like, oh, yeah, I have a swap. And then like, wow, you know, I can put a cap on my swap. You know, like, then like, you're sort of like, you're like doing, you know, all sorts of crazy stuff. And, you know, you get fairly, like, if you look at like the most arcane bullshit, like, like things structured by uh, an investment bank and you trace it back to like, someone building a factory. Like there aren't that many steps usually. Like, <laughs> the steps between like the factory and like yeah. the arcane bullshit are like, you know, there's like five steps, really, right? Like, yeah. like, you know, like, like to some extent you're on autopilot, right? You're like deep, liquid, perfect financial markets are good for the financing of projects. And therefore this thing that we're doing that clearly isn't financing a project, that's clearly like some gambling bullshit. Um, is good for the financing of projects because it creates deep liquid financial markets that people can sort of trade in and out of. Um, and so uh, normal people don't believe that and you're not obligated to believe that, right? But it's like, in many cases, not every case, but in many cases, no one's hurting anyone by trading derivatives with each other. And like the ability to create these deep liquid markets where people can trade everything they want does enable them sometimes to finance real companies. Um, I don't know, I used to write a lot about um, CDS stuff. And so like one thing that happened for a while is that, you know, there would be credit default swaps, like, um, uh, like uh, you know, contracts on, on, the, on the debt of a company. It's just like bilateral contracts where like, you know, two hedge funds make a bet on whether a company will default or not essentially. And um, the hedge funds making these bets were like, wait a minute. I can bet this company will default and then I'll go pay it some money to default on its debt. I, I could be the distressed credit investor that gains significant influence over the company's future. Uh, yeah, or like literally I can write yeah. it a check to default on its debt. Like it could, it could do a thing where it misses a payment by just the, yeah. amount, of time, just the right amount of time to trigger these CDS contracts. And then yeah. like this hedge fund will make money and, uh, and uh, the company will get money and like it'll be good for the company. And then the other hedge fund is like, well, wait a minute. I can give them more money not to default on their debt. And then there's a bidding war. Like there's, there's like, other, I don't think there's, there's been like one or two cases where you can kind of see there's been a bidding war, uh, I think. But so the point of this is that like, if you just look at that transaction in the abstract, it's like evil hedge funds trying to cheat each other, right? And like, and like, sure, that's what it is. Um, at the same time though, you have like this distressed company that needs money and has no avenues to get the money. And then like two hedge funds come to it and are like, we'd like to give you money to do some bullshit that doesn't affect you at all. Um, that's great, you know? That's like, that's like you you sort of short circuited the loop between like the crazy derivative and the like real world financing. Um, and there's other things to be said for CDS, right? Like, I mean, like you can read lots of papers about CDS that are like the existence of a, of a CDS market increases the liquidity of a company's debt, which allows it to finance itself more cheaply, which allows it to build factories or whatever. But also like the bullshit thing has like the, the particular, um, uh, 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 allows a particularly nice like financing to, to make bets. So, so do you do you think it's all a game at the end of the day? I mean, a lot of people say Wall Street is just a game, hedge fund wars. Like, well, I think that like I think that like you know, like much of it has the structure of a game, and that structure 
allows for a certain uh, like transparency and playability that encourages people to put a lot of money into it. And that money often in indirect ways like finances real world projects. It's not just a game, right? I mean, like clearly, um, you know, like, uh, you know, if you go back to like the electric vehicle SPACs, like everything, like it's all bullshit. Like there's so much bullshit encrusted around electric vehicle SPACs, right? SPACs are like these complicated financial instruments and like these EV companies like sometimes have dodgy statements, like, and, you know, like all sorts of it. And like, you know, look at the incentives of SPAC founders and like, and like, and like the warrants, like, like there's all sorts, like you can point to like 20 different things that feel like bullshit games and shit. But at the same time, it's like, well, they're funding the development of electric vehicles, right? I mean, like clearly like this is a capital intensive, uh, uh, innovative business that if it works out, will be good for the world. And it is being funded by like all this crap, you know? And so like, like, and like this specifically gamesmanship aspects of it are what not all of, but are part of what allows it to fund real world projects. Do you like the democratization of finance, the, the, this idea, this narrative, you know, platforms like Robinhood allow people to day trade, allow people to buy a fractional share of something and there are people, new innovations right now that you can own a fractional share of a fund, of a VC fund that, that can, you know, or, or you no, I mean, like, that, like, I don't, uh, you know, like I'm, does it hurt people at the end of the day? I mean, just getting more people. I don't think this. we're at the end of the day yet, right? I mean, I think a lot of people made a lot of money on GameStop. A lot of people lost money too. Um, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Like, it, it hurts them if the stocks go down, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that, uh, I think that, you know, like, it's hard to say it hurts them because like we're in like the sort of middle or maybe tail end of a giant retail bull market. Um, <laughs> but, uh, 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 you're throwing those uh, doomsday lines. Right? I own in. index funds, right? Like I, I think that like, I think that you know my general view of the matter is like it is hard to pick stocks that will go up, and I think that there are a lot of professional investors who work eighty hours a week at hedge funds trying to pick the stocks that will go up, and they do nothing but that, and they have all sorts of specialized resources and tools and computers and access to financing and access to companies and access to data and they work very hard at it and they nonetheless only sometimes succeed in picking stocks that go up and if you're a dentist and you spend an hour in your lunch break on robin hood like your odds of outperforming <laughs> the market are yeah. low now there are like like smart people will give you caveats to that and say no 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 it's actually harder for the professionals in various ways and if you're trading in small amounts and like you can you know, like i don't know there are arguments that like day trading is good but like it does seem like most of the time, most of the people who are like day trading on limited information um, probably would be better off in index funds. But I say that as a person in index funds who is like very much underperformed a lot of Redditors this year. So like you shouldn't really yes. listen to me. Because um, <laughs> like maybe I'm right in the long run, but, but how do you know? Right? Like maybe I'm not. Um, so I don't know. It seems like a little bit harmful. Um, I don't really buy the sort of the Robin Hood argument that like that like we need to democratize active trading of stocks. Like I think that like like if I think of like the heroes of like democratizing investing, like it's John Bogle, right? It's like it's like you can just buy all the stocks for free. Like what a great innovation that was. Um, and that's what I do. Uh, but um, uh, uh, obviously, some people disagree with me just like on, a, on an aesthetic basis, if nothing else. And some of them are getting rich, and I'm not. So you know, how can I criticize? Mr. Levine, I, don't, I know we don't have too much time left. I also don't want to run over too many uh, questions, but per perhaps just at the end. I mean, uh, what one question that was on my mind is that what percent? What do you think is the percentage of people who read your newsletter in full every day versus some days versus they're just on the list? I mean, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about. Do do, do you track the, your, your subscribers? Um, I, I'm, I, I'm aware of the open rate, but I'm probably not supposed to say it. Uh, uh, <laughs> it's good. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I'm sure that, actually, I'm not sure. Uh, but does, it, does it tell you that how many people actually read the email? You, you couldn't really tell. I mean, no, I don't Substack. Yeah. Can you I, tell that? I, I, I don't, well, I, I can't. 
maybe someone can i don't know i yeah, think that like yeah. in general if people read on the web there's there are there's metrics that will tell you if you can how much of the article people have read on the web i think in email that doesn't generally happen although like it can track opens um but i'm not at all an expert on these technologies and i don't want to know. <laughs> I only ask because I feel like you output so much and it, it's it's very hard to keep I up. I read too I, much. I, I, <laughs> Surely nobody reads all of it. Do people... Do it's very frustrating when people are like, oh, you should write about this story. I'm like, I wrote about it yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just at the end or something. Do, do you do you ever feel like a need to, to cut down, to shorten a little bit, t- yeah, tighten sometimes. it up, write, write some uh, too long, don't read or something? Sometimes you, you think about that? Or, sometimes, but I, also, I don't know. Like... Um, It's not like you don't have to read it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I don't yeah, care. That's a great like, way to think about this. Like, like, it's not like I'm not like I'm not like you know like um, giving people instructions to like you right. know save a life, right? Like it's just like you read it if you think it's fun, right? If you don't yeah, think it's fun, you don't read it. I don't care. Um, like like I'm you know like like if I were in the business of like telling traders what they need to know from the Fed minutes in order to like make their bond trades, like there would be one way of presenting that information. Like I'm in the business of entertaining people about finance. I'm going to write it in a way that I think is maximally entertaining. And if it's 4,000 words, then sorry. So, so if your column no longer becomes popular in a few years, wh- wh- why do you think could be the reason? Because we, when we have entrepreneurs on the show, we often ask them, if your company is, fails in five years, what would be the reason? So maybe I could entertain this question with you. If... That's a good question. Um, uh, if your column fails, why? <laughs> gosh, I hope it's because I like uh, I like sell a book that becomes a movie and become too rich to write every day. Now, um, uh, if my column, like, I mean, like, like to me, the biggest risk is that you know you do this too long and you you sort of like repeat yourself in various ways, right? Like, you repeat like arguments and themes and topics and stylistic text. And like eventually people get sick of me and I get sick of myself or some combination thereof. And like, you know, I, like, like there's a good argument that like an op-ed columnist shouldn't have that job for more than like five years. And I don't think of myself as an op-ed columnist. Like I am explaining things, like there keep being new things to explain. But I do, um, I do worry about people getting sick of me and I worry a lot about getting sick of myself, right? And those are, those are the big risks. So, so if that were to happen, what the other would be risk a- is like like a weirder risk is like, you know, when I started, like I, I had a lot of like, I wrote a lot about, you know, after the financial crisis, there was like a lag, and then like five or six years after the financial crisis, as the as the statute of limitations was beginning to expire, people brought all the, like regulators brought all these cases against banks for doing stuff in the financial crisis, and it was like this enormously illuminating period because like you learned about all these trading strategies and like weird things that banks built that were not really publicly available, but then like got publicly exposed by regulatory actions. And it was a great time to learn about how banks worked. And banks were really interesting in 2007, right? They were doing a lot of really complicated stuff. And I think that like in 2021, banks are generally less interesting. Like they do less complicated stuff for, you know, competitive for reasons, reasons but also because like regulators like really tried to make them less interesting yeah. and succeeded. Um, and so some of my expertise in what I write about comes from banks, right? Like relatively little of my expertise. And I wrote about, like, I guess you'd call it a DeFi protocol today. Like, I don't know. You yeah, yeah. Like, relatively little of my expertise is in DeFi, right? And like in five years, if like all of finance is run on the blockchain and like run on DeFi protocols, I hope that I will adapt and be good <laughs> at writing about it. Yeah. But I think I will have less native advantage over other people in doing that. And so I think that's a, that's a risk too. And just in general, like I, you know, it is like, I have had to adapt to like banks being less interesting. And I write less about banks than I used to because banks are less fun than they used to be. Um, and you know, and I write more about crypto because crypto is really fun, but like, again, I, it's not my native expertise in the way that banks are. So that's another risk. Um, there's like the general risk of me being boring as a person. And then there's the specific risk of like the topics that I'm best suited to write about becoming less salient and other topics becoming more important. So do you foresee yourself keep doing this for a, a long time or at least the foreseeable future or 
Uh, yeah, I don't know what else I'd do. Like, I feel is like this I, the, the passion you finally settled on? I really do like on. it. I really like <laughs> it's like it's grueling, but like I, it, it is a passion in a way that like selling derivatives was not. Um, so yeah, uh, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Uh, awesome. I, I guess um, p- perhaps one 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 last uh, question. Uh, the name of our show is Policy Punchline, so I always ask the, at the end to our guests, what would what would your punchline be? Uh, for, for this interview, for your writings, for for anything. Uh, wait, I have to have a punchline. <laughs> yeah, just that. <laughs> uh, You're the only guest who, who everything said, I have is to securities have fraud. I don't know. <laughs> um, punchline. Uh, uh, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, word, I, I don't know. Everything, yeah, is everything is security. Fraud. Fraud. That's, that sounds great. No, I have to say, I mean, Mr. Mr. Levine, this is such a great honor to, to finally meet you. And, and thanks so much for doing it's this. It's too late to say, call me Matt, but you should really call me Matt. No one calls me Mr. Levine. Matt, Matt has to students a decade ago. <laughs> <laughs> the, the first time I still remember why I got on your email list, I, I was doing also doing podcast interview and uh, Joyce Chang, who was the, the global chair of research for JP Morgan, she was on campus and she, she and I did an interview. And then there was a, fifth year economics PhD student at Princeton who watched me did, did the interview and he came up to me later he, and he said Tiger you should read Matt Levine oh. uh, <laughs> in case you, you you don't follow him and uh, <laughs> so I that, that was that was the day uh, when I got into you that was more than more than two years ago when I was a oh. sophomore and uh, uh, it, it continued all the way till today so so uh, I, I really have to say um <laughs> After today, less impressed. <laughs> Definitely less impressed by the by the by the person, by the insights. <laughs> by my Zoom background. <laughs> no, it's it's truly a great honor to 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 do this interview. So Thank thanks you so much. It was fun. Thank you. Yeah. So that was my interview with Mr. Matt Levine. He is a Bloomberg opinion columnist covering finance. He writes the popular daily newsletter, Money Staff that has over 150,000 subscribers, which I encourage you to subscribe on Bloomberg.com. It's uh, free. And uh, thanks so much for listening today. Please follow us on iTunes, Spotify. You may watch this uh, video on YouTube. You've been listening to Policy Punchline, a podcast generously supported by the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance at Princeton University. We would also like to encourage you to follow other podcasts produced by Princeton University, such as Politics and Polls by the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. Policy Punchline is intended to be informational only and does not reflect nor represent the views of Princeton University or the Julius Rabinowitz Center for Public Policy and Finance. For more information on subscription, donation, volunteering, or contact, please visit policypunchline.com. Thank you again for listening.